The Secret of Life. I'll give it to you now in case you have to hurry off soon. <laughs> the Secret of Life. One could say there are... By the way, anything I say is provisional. It's not about the ultimate philosophical explanations of the universe, but about an inner transformation of consciousness. So the words are pointing to this, the shift in consciousness. And as pointers, they can be helpful, but as ultimate explanations of the universe, they are mistakes. So knowing that, I can carry on. There are two dimensions to you, to who you are. One you're very familiar with, that's called the person, me, you as the personal entity with a, with a past and a future, your personal history and so on, including the physical body. So there's the physical body and there's the psychological entity, the me, with a name and a past and its problems and so on its life situation. Usually that is the limit to what people's perception of themselves, that is the limit to what they see, that's who I am. Not realizing that there is also a deeper dimension in them, which we could call, again it's provision, it's a pointer, the light of consciousness. So at any moment, you are both the person, but you are also the light of consciousness that has nothing to do with, your, with you, the person, or your personal history. And when the light of consciousness predominates at any moment over the personal sense of self, I call that, or we call that being present. There is a presence which you cannot touch or see. You cannot make it into an object of consciousness that says, ah, oh, there's the presence that I am. There it is. No, you can't do that because the presence is the eternal subject. It cannot become an object to your consciousness, but you can. This is why you have a relationship with yourself. The person, the personal sense of self, you become an object to yourself, to consciousness. So you love yourself. You hate yourself. You have doubts about yourself. And you have a, lots of stories about yourself. So you've become an object to yourself, and that's the egoic self, the personalized sense of self. The, we can't escape that completely, but to, be, to know only that, to know yourself as only that, is a dreadful limitation. Then you are just that very limited person. So in any situation, if you can sense the presence that is deeper than the person in you, and right, the situation is now, this moment, it's always now. You can't do this later, <laughs> it's now. That's right, there's the signal, be present. So how does that look in daily life, when you are interacting, when you are in situations, dealing with other people, having to do this or that? Let's take a simple situation. You're meeting someone in the elevator. 
and you're exchanging a few words. Of course, you, um, there's one person, that's you, meeting another person there. You may know that person, lives in your building or works in the office, or you may not know that person. Perhaps you exchange a few words about the weather or whatever. <clears throat> Perhaps you, the mind has some judgments about that person. Perhaps. Are you there exclusively as that person, or at that uh, during that seemingly insignificant encounter? Can you also sense the presence that you are beyond anything that you say or do? Can you sense the presence, your own presence, so to speak, as the light of consciousness, as you're looking at that other human being? You say a few words, but there is... Can you be that as well as still operate as the person. You can't let go completely of that. You are continue to have a physical body and a certain psychological makeup. Can, in, but in any situation, and especially this one here, this is a kind of trial, an easy protected setting where we can practice being both the person, of course you are, but at the same time, and here perhaps more strongly, feeling, sensing that you are consciousness, as con not as an object, but as the subject, the I. Feeling the deeper, sensing the deeper I as consciousness itself. And that is joyful to to know yourself as the as consciousness is, is in, you sense an intense aliveness there in your entire energy field not just the head the sensing of an aliveness in the entire energy field and in there you don't need to think unless there's something to think about. And a lot of the time, for example now, there isn't really anything to think about. You can just join this, what looks like a person, and everybody else here, who look like a person, join us, join me, in that simple sense of a live presence. And if you, the, the person that you are is not totally obliterated, but temporarily, it, one could say, it recedes into the background. It's almost as if it's for a while, you are not a person because you, there's nothing at this moment that you need to remember about your past or your problems because your problems have no reality at this moment. Only when thought starts, your problems, because everybody has them, then you remember your problems. But in the simplicity and actuality of this moment, you have no problem. And that's an amazing thing to, to realize that Right now, there is no problem here, even if you had a toothache. It wouldn't be a problem, it would just be a toothache. But it doesn't become a problem. It's only when you start thinking about it, it becomes a problem. So everybody carries around with them in their head, in their energy field, a problematic life situation. I don't know anybody whose life situation is not to a greater or lesser extent problematic. Unfinished business here, things that you don't know how they're going to work out in the future, things that went wrong in the past that may go wrong tomorrow, 
other people, what they want, intentions of other people, what they are going to do to you, and what, how is this going to work? Is it all going to work out? <laughs> That's called a life situation, and it's problematic. And the strange thing is, everybody has that. And sometimes it's much more problematic than at other times because, so that's why I say to a greater or lesser extent, you carry around a problematic life situation. If that absorbs your entire consciousness 24 hours a day, except in dreamless sleep, so it's a bit less than 24 hours, it absorbs your entire attention, your entire consciousness, it's like living with some voracious parasite. It's just, this is so important, it matters. Just think about this. And it eats up your energy, your, your consciousness, it becomes thoughts. And it's a dreadful state. So you discover, yes, there is a problematic life situation and it is unlikely, and that's the strange thing, that it will ever not be problematic for very long. The problems can lessen considerably as you become more present, but even as you become more present, you're still faced with challenges in the world of form. The way you deal with challenges in the world of form becomes much easier, so that is true. And you are much less likely to create a drama around you, unnecessary drama, that is true. You are much less likely to get involved in conflict situations with others, that is true. But to, there will always be challenges and there will be things that can be considered problems in your life situation. Until the moment when death approaches, of course, that is the end of your problems. <laughs> so it's important to realize that the challenges will be there in daily life. They will, you will continue to have a life situation and you may not ever feel that now everything is absolutely sorted out in my life. <laughs> everything is in its place total order in my life situation. It's not going to happen. <laughs> Do you think I have total order in my life situation? No. There are things that should be dealt with, haven't been dealt with. Disorder at home that hasn't been cleaned, that still needs to, there's a pile of papers there that hasn't been sorted out. You have got mailbags, haven't looked at them, they've been unopened for four weeks, and new mailbags are arriving. And that's only a small example. <laughs> so if you have the demand or expectation that one day everything on the external realm will be absolutely great so that it doesn't cause you any more concern, it's not going to happen. If it did happen, your life would become quite lifeless. <coughs> so knowing that there is, on the, on the level of your life situation, on the level of form, life continues to be challenging. That's how it's designed to be. And through life being challenging, actually, a deepening happens inside you you awake, the awakening intensifies or deepens or accelerates. Now what does that mean, the awakening? The awakening out of complete identification with the forms of your life, especially thought forms, so that you realize beyond all the things in my life situation, there is another dimension, and you don't know that conceptually, but you know it directly, 
there is the term which I sometimes call the, the transcendent dimension. And that can be experienced or sensed at any moment as the simple, powerful fact of the light of consciousness that you are. Before the light of consciousness turns into a thought or into something, there's the light of just consciousness. And here's your life situation. So you transcend that. You don't deny the life situation or you run away from it or you feel suicidal because I can't deal with such stuff anymore. No, this, you transcend, you rise above, so to speak, and there you see your life situation and there you realize yourself, the timeless self, as the light of consciousness that is not touched by your life situation. It's not touched by time. It's just that. And then, at first it seems you can either be present or you can be lost in your, in your stuff. That's how it at first seems people, okay, I can do it. If, if nobody disturbs me, I can be present. Shh, don't nobody say anything. <laughs> and if nobody moves the furniture around me, things have to be because it's, I'm familiar with the furniture here and this there, nothing must change. Okay, now I can be present. And that may be a true experience, but it, it's not deep enough to be, to sustain itself when somebody moves the furniture a few inches. Why did you do that? <laughs> This shouldn't be here. It has been, never been here before. There was that book a few years ago, which became a bestseller, a tiny book, Who Moved My Cheese? <laughs> it's about learning to accept change because it's all around you continuously. <laughs> so at first it seems, okay, and then you're thinking of, I have to move to an ashram. It's only there I can do it. I need the ideal, an ideal environment for my presence practice, and I can't, they won't leave me alone, these people. <laughs> but if you did move to an ashram, you would be surprised to find that it is also, in most cases, a microcosm of the world outside because many people in the ashram try it the same as you. They try to get away from things, not realizing they carry the world inside their heads with them. <laughs> <laughs> and as the saying goes, I think it's even, it's a book with a title, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> so the the art then is to bring the presence into the daily, your daily existence so that it seeps through the gaps in your daily life. The gaps, and let's come back to the situation in the elevator where you're meeting a stranger or an acquaintance, exchange a few words, there can be there a gap too, a gap where for a few seconds you're just present. Three, four seconds, you look at the other person and you're not a per person at this moment, you are the light of consciousness. And then you take a more difficult situation, you're, you're, you're on your way to see the lawyer about some complex business thing or somebody, some court case or divorce proceedings. That, no, that tends to occupy your mind because <clears throat> and then you, when you go into the lawyer, you, you can see how totally trapped in their 
life situation that Brahmacula people are. It's a must be a terrible thing for a lawyer because they always meet people in their most unconscious state. <laughs> Realtors too, or they meet people in their most unconscious state because the moment you're dealing with the buying and selling a house or a place, they go totally. What's <laughs> going on? Ac accusing and. <laughs> totally lost in, in their life situation, in the world of form, in their thoughts, in an illusory sense of identity. Why is it illusory? Because the essence they are unaware of. The essence of who they are, they are unaware of. They are only aware of the surface movement of the conceptual self and the movement of thought unaware of the deeper essence of who they are as consciousness or as the light of consciousness. But you can, even on your way to see the divorce lawyer, be present for a moment. You look at the sky as the car stops at the lights. And in that moment, you can sense the presence through which the sky is being perceived. And at the next light, you can look at the, the little, the breeze moving the leaves on the tree. And again, you can sense the presence behind the person. And when you, when you then walk into the lawyer's office, yes, you are there as a person, but there is a little bit of peace in the background that walks with you into the lawyer's office. And that's the, because you know yourself also as the presence. You are the presence and the person at the same time. So you're no longer totally trapped in the personal sense of self. It still operates and it may come in waves. You may, the wave may come, you're totally trapped again. In, and then you wake up and you look Sometimes the sense perception can be helpful. You look out of the window, you, on the lawyer's desk there's a flower or a plant. Or you simply, anything you become aware of, as, as a, simple, a simple sense perception can be helpful. Take you out of your mind into... And how wonderful then, as you, as you gradually master the art of being being two dimensions of embodying two dimensions here the dimension of the of form in which you you unquestionably are a person and the dimension of the formless the consciousness itself that is not a person i don't even want to go into right here we don't need that a discussion whether Consciousness is a byproduct of matter, as some people claim, scientists. Some might even say consciousness is an illusion, doesn't exist. Or they say, well, it's an illusion that matter is having. <laughs> <laughs> or whether consciousness is something beyond matter, something that organizes matter, that expresses itself through matter, or whether, as the ancient philosopher Plotinus, I believe, said, matter, matter is the furthest that consciousness can get away from itself. <laughs> We don't need to discuss that or arrive at some philosophical conclusion because the, the fact of consciousness is beyond doubt. The fact that you are conscious at this moment is beyond doubt. Actually, that's the only thing that's beyond doubt about your whole existence. Everything else could be a dream. What happens in the consciousness could all be a dream. 
in, in a way it is dreamlike because it doesn't last it it evaporates quickly like a dream but the one thing that Descartes philosopher mistakenly said I think therefore I am if he had gone one step further he would have realized I am conscious therefore I am and that would have been the the right realization so the fact that you are conscious at this moment is beyond doubt maybe that's the rest is a dream but there's a light in which the dream appears if it is a dream and you are that and to know that and know yourself as that that's called self-realization in some teachings ancient teachings and I believe that is also what Jesus talked about really when he used the misunderstood term salvation so that is our our practice the art of moving in the two di the two dimensions the dimension of form without losing awareness of the light of consciousness it's a bit like if you were an actor on a screen in a movie let's say you are the figure in a movie let's say you're Hamlet let's say there's um, they've made movies out of the play Hamlet so you're on the screen you're the character Hamlet and you're saying to be or not to be which really is he's, he's asking himself shall I commit suicide or not <clears throat> if at this moment this car this is this figure on the screen could realize his essential identity as the light of the projector then his his problem situation would no longer be so desperate <laughs> because then there's a third option between either carrying on in this futile struggle or kill myself that's basically what he's asking whether to take arms against a sea of troubles or by opposing end them this, uh, what's on <laughs> <laughs> so he's asking either I carry on in this futile struggle with one one problematic situation after another or maybe it's more courageous to commit suicide and both options don't seem that attractive not realizing that it is a third option and that is realize that the essence of who you are is the light from the projector <laughs> I'm using just the analogy and if Hamlet could realize ooh <laughs> I'm actually I'm the light then there's no longer that that despair in his life situation he can look at it and say hmm I could kill myself but there's no real not really any point and and then he would deal with whatever he would do whatever he can do without losing touch with his essential reality of the light of consciousness the light can then in flow into what he does and says and it will be wise before it couldn't there can, is no wisdom there you just reactivity so then you can deal with that and do the right thing and then of course the whole play of Hamlet would degenerate it would no longer be the drama <laughs> <laughs> and it would become from the point of view of the spectator who wants the drama would perhaps become a little uninteresting well it's all working out in the end the harmony prevails of course then another situation happens that's different but that in that particular situation 
seems to be working out, then wait for the next challenge. So it's not the end of challenges, but... Oh. So there's the... I'm using that analogy, but it's, it's helpful. You are that character. And you can become aware of your essential reality. And that is salvation. Saves you from being immersed in a sea of troubles continuously. Total frustration with life. And then you can welcome the challenges of life as they come. Because through that, the presence deepens. Occasionally it may happen that some new challenge comes in and you lose presence for a while. And then you wake up again. What was all that? <laughs> Two days of drama. Two days of just reactivity and complaining and accusing and calling others this and that and sleepless nights and then you... Hamlet is waking up again. <laughs> oh, it's not so bad after all, is it? So you, that's a, that is our practice. The wonderful thing is we realize that the world is not here to make you happy. Because as, lo as long as you think it's here to make you happy, you're trapped in an illusory reality. But if anything, the world is here to make you conscious. It does that by giving you challenges. Now try this one. <laughs> and if you master this one, oh, let now you talk about this one. The shift that then happens is you're no longer a suffering entity. Challenges, yes, but the challenges no longer produce suffering. Not because you detach yourself, no, because you're in touch with that, with there is that dimension in you that's not touched by any of that stuff. And there's an intelligence that comes through from there that changes even the way in which you deal with the stuff that comes at you. That's the secret of life. So this, this means you still have to do it. So I can't give you the secret of life. It's like giving you a, a key and say, this key will free you from suffering well, you still have to use the key. <clears throat> and really, that's then the purpose of your life is that. It's a practice to the point where you can actually welcome a challenge when it comes. <laughs> oh. And that's the... Uh, Gratitude then can be in your life not only for the good things, the gratitude can be there for whatever arises. Loving what is. Loving what is. Whatever arises. As Meister Eckhart said, not me, I say Eckhart. <laughs> uh, if your only prayer were to say thank you, for the rest of your life, that would be enough. You don't need any other prayer. 
If that were your only prayer, thank you, that's enough. Thank you for what is, thank you for this moment, the aliveness of this moment. It will make you conscious. It does that by giving you challenges. Now try this one. <laughs> and if you master this one, oh, let now you talk about this one. The shift that then happens is you're no longer a suffering entity. Challenges, yes, but the challenges no longer produce suffering. Not because you detach yourself, no, because you're in touch with that, which there is that dimension in you that's not touched by any of that stuff. And there's an intelligence that comes through from there that changes even the way in which you deal with the stuff that comes at you. That's the secret of life. So this, this means you still have to do it. So I can't give you the secret of life. It's like giving you a, a key and say, this key will free you from suffering well, you still have to use the key. <clears throat> and really, that's then the purpose of your life is that. It's a practice to the point where you can actually welcome a challenge when it comes. <laughs> oh. And that's the... Uh, Gratitude then can be in your life not only for the good things, the gratitude can be there for whatever arises. Loving what is, loving what is, whatever arises. As Meister Eckhart said, not me, I say Eckhart. <laughs> uh, if your only prayer were to say thank you, for the rest of your life, that would be enough. Of, you don't need any other prayer. If that were your only prayer, thank you, that's enough. Thank you for what is. Thank you for this moment. The aliveness of this moment, that's enough. Thank you for what is. Thank you for this moment the aliveness of this moment.